yes, oh yes, oh yes, the big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. I could play um, Stairway to Heaven uh, when I was 12. Jimmy Page didn't actually write it until he was 22. I think that says quite a lot. Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. Today on the podcast with her humble host, Michael Scotto, in the great state of North Carolina, we have concluding thoughts on music and my illustrious musical career, what it was like getting into a band, what it was like to play. We talked about a little bit about Rush, a little bit about the Beatles, a little bit more about Paul McCartney. And we encourage everybody, no matter where you're from, no matter what you do, no matter what your art is, no matter what your expression is, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Let's support each other in that. And let's just have some fun and hang out. Do you want to be king of the beasts? Do you want a royal life of ease? Do you think a rhino's life is fun? Don't you know it's hot under the sun, sitting in the sunshine of another lonely day? hoping that the small and weak will someday go away. Would you like to live out what you feel? Perhaps a rum and coke will seal the deal. You live your life while others sink or swim. Don't you know you can't live on a whim? Sitting in the sunshine of another lonely day, hoping that the winds of fortune always blow your way. Now, that's from the genius of Michael Scott. Oh, it's a song called A Rhino's Life. And it was based on this club, actually, in downtown Greensboro. I don't know if it's still there called the Rhino Club, and it's where people, I won't say anything, I don't want to be nasty about that, and there's a reason I wrote it at the time, there was somebody I had in mind, <laughs> but anyway, with the up and coming, went to try to be up and coming, it's kind of a dark song, minor key, which is not unusual for me, and I have a demo of it, I did in uh, my garage, as a matter of fact, with the keyboard, and has percussion, and I added solo bits and stuff to it, anyway, it exists somewhere in the world, just thought I'd start off with some of my lyrics this time. As I was thinking about playing, and this is Pat too, I was thinking, reading something Getty Lee said about bass playing. And he said that bass playing, what you want to try to do if you can, is to kind of have a secondary melody to the song. It carries the song along and it never interferes with the singer and it never interferes with the main melody of the song. But it carries its own melody. And that kind of hangs underneath the song and carries it all the way through. And it goes from the top of the neck to the bottom of the neck, etc. And I thought it was interesting. He said it actually commenting on Paul McCartney's bass playing about what an amazing bass player Paul McCartney is. Because we get into this, I, this discussion about musicians and people that are better than other musicians. And as you know, or anybody who knows me knows, I think Paul McCartney, and I've said it before, is an absolute genius, not only at writing melodies, which nobody has written as many melodies as Paul McCartney, particularly memorable ones. And not just like catchy TV camera. These are tremendous melodies. And we talked about that last time, his lyric writing, etc. But as a musician, as a bass player, this is some things that bass players have recognized. Now, Jacko Pastorius is a tremendous bass player, was a tremendous bass player. I wouldn't take anything away from him. But I watched a video today of a little girl. I think couldn't have been nine, ten years old. And she was playing a fretless bass line from Jacko. Now, she didn't write it. <laughs> it's Jacko's bass line, and so it's, it's brilliant. But just because you have the technical prowess to do something doesn't make you better than somebody else. It doesn't make you more valuable to a band, let's say. Now, you can go into guitar stores all across this country and find a lot of kids who are technically good guitarists. They can run up and down the neck or bass players. But that doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to be a good guitarist for your band. That doesn't even mean that they're going to be a good guitarist at all, the fact that they can do that. Again, in our opening here, that was from the comic strip, Bad News, uh, a mockumentary, which actually came out six months before Spinal Tap on British TV on the BBC. Anyway, the point there being, just because you can play Stairway to Heaven doesn't mean you can write Stairway to Heaven. See what I'm saying? Just because that nine-year-old little girl can play a five-string fretless bass Jaco Pastorius song doesn't mean that she's Jaco Pastorius. doesn't mean she can write it. And even just writing it, just being complex, doesn't make it any better. I was listening to a couple of Jacko tracks, 
where he's covering the Beatles. And yeah, he's really good. I'm not taking anything away from him. And I'm sure if he was still around, I'd enjoy seeing a show. But it's just not as good as the original. It's just not as good. I mean, Paul McCartney, one was Dear Prudence. And I'm sorry, I mean, Paul McCartney's, based on Dear Prudence, is magical. It's perfect for the song. It's exactly what Getty Lee's talking about. It has its own melody, but it doesn't rob from the melody of the song. It doesn't rob from the singer. But if you just listen to the bass, it's, it's magical. And it's, it's what exactly the song calls for. So, you know, and, and this is what Getty Lee's talking about with Paul McCartney. Same thing with Ringo. We talked about, I talked about John Waite saying that Ringo's drumming. It's like, he's like a singer, percussionist. And it is, it's incredible. And I'm not taking anything away from other drummers, like a Neil Peart. Neil Peart's the absolute perfect drummer for Rush. Perfect, and he's technically excellent. And he's, he's better than just technically good. He's, he's really good, and he really, and he does, and Getty Lee was talking about him as well, that he drums along, he drums the song, too, which is what Ringo did, and Ringo did it, you know, 250 times with the Beatles, where he drummed the song. Everything's so unique, and the fills, Phil Collins was talking about how unique Ringo's fills are, and where they come from, and the uniqueness of them, and how he drums the song, and how Phil Collins took so much from that, and how much he admires Ringo. But so it's not just the technical end of things. Now, I probably wasted too much time on that, <laughs> but I get into those discussions. So in my bass playing, at least when I listen to it, I go back and I go, you know, I, I kind of, I was trying to add something to the songs, trying to add something to the songs, because technically I'm very limited, you know, and I try different things and sometimes I get lucky and, you know, just find something that just kind of works and is really interesting. But, you know, in my band, in the bands, I main band I was in, nothing but Sky and then different variations of that same band i was probably the least talented one or at least the least technical of on my instrument than anyone else and we had people in the band who could have played bass better than i can but that's not what i was going for i was you know i wasn't going for complexity necessarily i was going to try to do the best bass line bass line i could now i come from an interesting bloodline there's a lot of artistic talent in my bloodline in different ways i got none of it has <laughs> been able to draw anything. You know, I famously, my kids know that I can draw 3D stickmen. That's about all I can do. But my, my father was an electrical engineer, and so he was very good at drafting and those sorts of things, being an electrical engineer. He was actually a very nationally known electrical engineer, and an expert in quality. And on my mother's side, there were sculptors and painters. Uh, she, she was born in Italy and in her town of Bari, San Michele de Bari, the village in Bari where she's from, and I've been there, uh, the sculpture, there's still sculpture there, and there's artwork that we have in our home now from her uncles. You know, even seeing throughout my family just the range of talents, uh, immediate family. And then my, uh, my daughters, all three of them, I've talked about this before, they've done artwork that's really, I, I couldn't dream of doing. I couldn't dream of it. And now my daughter, Brooklyn, is getting ready to finish her fifth year in architecture. She finished her fourth year and received her bachelor degree last year, but now she's finished the fifth year, which will make her fully eligible for licensure in, in North Carolina to be an architect. And not only her architecture work is very creative, her artwork, apart from that, I mean, going back to high school, it's really, it's really phenomenal. And so there's a lot of that in my bloodline. Again, a lot of it skipped me. And even in my extended family of marriage, I am related or was related through marriage to Paul O'Neill, the guy who put together Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Uh, and he was actually brilliant, and he was a really nice guy. I never met him or got to know him because my family would get backstage passes and, and free tickets whenever they came through for the Christmas show. Now, Trans-Siberian had at least, I think, at least three. Uh, it's either two or three, but I think it was three different versions of the band, and they would travel different parts of the country. So living in the South, I didn't see Paul O'Neill. He didn't come here. But when he was up north, my family, he would take them backstage. He was super nice to them. He gave my nephew a guitar, which I'm still angry about this day because I didn't get one. But he was super nice. And he made sure we got our tickets for when we went in Alabama and here in North Carolina. And we got to meet the band. And we got to sit in the great seats. And it was just, you know, he's a super talented guy. Super talented guy. He's now passed on. Paul was cousin to my cousins. And so he grew up in New York around my older brothers and sisters are all New Yorkers. I'm not a New Yorker, but that's where they grew up. That's where they were born. So they all knew each other. So, um, you know, not blood related to him, but, you know, in a distant way related to him. But he, he didn't consider that. He was just a great guy. Also, my father's cousin, who would be my cousin, so my first cousin once removed, 
She was married uh, to Bart Barcelona, who was a trombone player in the Stan Kent Orchestra and others. And he's played with Sinatra, etc. I mean, very accomplished trombonist. And then, of course, my niece, Tara, her husband is John Ringhofer. Now, I talked about Dennis and Whitmer last time. But John is an artist on his own. He was on Asthmatic Kitty. I don't think he's on that label anymore. And I saw on a list recently as one of the top 10 most interesting Christian artists in, on, a, on a magazine online, listed with some other luminaries. Craig in the band, he, he saw that and he said, I'm going to go listen to it. And he listened to it. And, and it's really interesting stuff. It's really talented, multi-talented guys. And again, I'm not related by blood to any of these people, but I have the, I've been fortunate to at least you know, have some of that influence, at least from a distance. And at least the, the, the idea, the ideals that they had, the, the drive that they had to play music. So we're already 10 minutes into this thing, and I was going to continue my thoughts on playing, but that's really what it is. It's taking all of these things, and if you're going to play, just play. I started playing bass because I'm a huge Paul McCartney fan, and I was taking a summer class, and this all works into how the Lord works too, I was taking a summer class at UNC Greensboro, the University of North Carolina Greensboro, goes Martins. I was sitting down outside the class and I love taking summer classes because you take like one per summer session and you go there and you're there every single day for an extended period of time and you knock out a class in five weeks right, for the semester. And you meet other people and you hang out because, you know, you go to class all morning and then you, have, you hang out with them in the afternoon if, or unless you go to work or something. All that to say, I was sitting there waiting, and above me on the board in the Bryant, uh, in the business school at UNC Greensboro, there was a thing, somebody was selling a bass and an amp, bass and an amp. And I saw it, and I was working at the time at Service Merchandise, which doesn't exist anymore, by the old Carolina Circle Mall, which doesn't exist anymore. And I went over to the guy, and I just, after class, I just said, I want your bass. So I bought the bass, and then I went over to the music loft, where I'd been before, because I just, like, I knew musicians there. Uh, the Eclipse Band from Greensboro. <laughs> when I was 15, I was kind of a fan of theirs. And I just knew some people in there. So I went over there and I bought some bass books. And I just sat in my room, in my apartment, and taught myself bass. Taught myself the neck. Taught myself the keys. You know, that sort of thing. The fingering and all that. And then one day, I was on campus. My best friend in high school, his sister, started UNCG. So she's younger than and we are. And she was living on a hallway there in Cone Dorm. And on her hallway was a girl who transferred there, a girl I knew from my youth group, Susan, who was dating this guy named Brandon. And her roommate, Susan's roommate, was this girl named Piper that I had a little bit of a crush on. Anyway, so I was hanging around them. And Brandon was in there one time. And he had his guitar and he was playing it. And he just said, I'm putting a band together. He had been in a band and he was putting another band together. I said, do you, do you have, do you play anything? And I said, well, I kind of play bass. He said, oh, great. Why don't you come out? And he said, and then do you have any lyrics? And so I came by one time and I brought lyrics to a song I have, which is called Why Did I Fight? Which is me <laughs> trying to rewrite a Sting song. Talk about trying to be allegorical. I tried to use war as an allegory for a relationship. Uh, why did I fight this strife? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Listen, comrade in arms, you are not worth my life. There's dirt on my face, I slowly walk on home. My crawling heart sighs, once again I am alone. So Brandon and I wrote that together, and I thought, okay, we've just found the next Leonard McCartney, right? And we got together in his basement, and I was standing in my basement, and he just looked at me, and Brandon, again, very proficient and very good guitar player, and we start playing, and he's looking at me. I, I had, I'd played in my apartment, and I played along with some stuff, but I never played an original song. So he just looked at me and said, look, I'm not teaching you anything. You got to figure it out. So I did and came up with a, a bass line for that song. <laughs> and I leaned on that for the next 20 years, 30 years of my life. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm glad he did that. I'm glad he did that. He did help occasionally. He once in a while he'd show me on his guitar. He'd say, "Try doing something like this," you know, if he had an idea. So he was helpful. But in him making me come up with the bass lines, it really helped. And again, it's great to have, when you have a great when you're a bassist. It helps to have a great drummer. And again, Scott was a great drummer, and to play off Scott's beats was really great as a drummer. I mean, as a bass player, it was really helpful. There were three of us. Speaking of Rush, there were three of us. 
And Brandon wanted another, we brought in a keyboard player that didn't work out. We brought in a background vocalist that didn't work out. So we, he finally, like I said, he worked last time at, at the, last time I mentioned that he worked at the Music Loft, More Music, and he met a guitarist there, Craig, and he brought Craig over. And when Craig came in, you know, I was suspicious. We'd been through some bad people. <laughs> but Craig put his amp down, and um, I won't tell you that story because it's, Craig will tell you the, his version, and it's a complete lie about what I said to him. <laughs> we'll cover that some other time. Maybe when I have Craig on as a guest. I've been threatening to have Craig on as a guest here for three years, and I just haven't done it. Anyway, he put his amp down, and he put a Muppet on top of it, which was um, Animal. And I'm a huge Muppet guy. And um, I, I said something like, you know, you're not angry, are you? And he said, I'm not angry. I'm just terribly, terribly hurt, which is Marvin Martian. from where, And right there, I mean, that was... It was over for Brandon at that point because now the band was going to change the whole feel. <laughs> I was pretty quiet to that point because, you know, I was just happy to be there and I was trying to learn my parts and do everything else. And But at that point, you know, once we got the Muppets and Warner Brothers in, involved, <laughs> I knew I found my uh, my long lost brother right then. And Craig and I have been very close ever since. And again, he he's he was a really excellent addition to Nothing But Sky. He freed up Brandon a little bit. He took some of the solos and again, their styles were very different, but v blended very well. And they could, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me, I could see how they could see what each other was trying to do on the guitar and they would kind of help each other because I see what you're trying to do there. And I mean, that's, that's kind of neat for me when you're on the inside of it and you're seeing that. And then you hear the song come out the other side. That's really kind of a neat thing to see. So anyway, I encourage people to, to find something whether you you don't have to be like I don't have to be Jaco Pastorius I don't have to be Paul McCartney and the one thing I've always suffered from is I always think I got to be the next Lennon McCartney I got to be the next McCartney on bass it's just not going to happen you know, it's not going to happen these are once in a lifetime things I mean it, it's good to, to better yourself but do what you want to do I mean have fun play for the for the joy of it and I've been fortunate in that I've spent actually most of my time now as a bassist playing in praise bands. I don't play much anymore, you know, just around here. But most of my live playing actually was when I was in Alabama and playing in the praise band. And then Craig and I had a short stint. We had a band called Solo Fide. We submitted a cassette to a local radio, Christian radio station. And they were going to choose 10 artists to open at a Cindy Morgan concert. And, you, you know, you play two or three songs. Everybody can play two or three songs. Now. But unfortunately, they let people sing to backing cassettes, which is really not a fair thing to do. I mean, there were only actually three bands there out of the 10. So we were there playing our own instruments, singing original music. Craig and I were writing original Christian music, playing our own music. We had a full arrangement there. We had background singers, we had keyboards, drums, guitars, bass. And his brother came and played guitar with us, which was really kind of a neat thing. And we really thought we had something there. And there was a thing at the time called Reformation Records that Steve Camp was putting together. And we sent a demo our self-recorded demo to him showing that, you know, we're really focused in our lyrics. You know, the name of our band is Solo Fide, Faith Alone. And we were really focused on this. And we thought, okay, this is what, well, I don't know, nothing ever became a Reformation Records. Never heard back from them. Maybe, maybe we ruined it. Maybe they said, well, this is it, fellas. This is the best we're going to get. Where's a close shot? <laughs> you know, I don't know. But anyway, we were doing a lot of that. And a lot of been able to do is write Christian music and write Christian songs. And, uh, you know, you don't have to do that. The other thing too about Christian music is, you don't have to write every single song is Amazing Grace. Uh, we have lives too. So if I sing about my kids or I sing about my life or I sing about my wife or just sing about generically about, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships just to write a song, that's okay. Uh, because we don't go 24 seven, you know, we go to work, we have dinner, we laugh. I mean, scripture talks a lot about that, about, about having a merry heart and those sorts of things, enjoying life in light of the Lord, under the sun, but in the light of the Lord. So it's all there together. You never forget the Lord, and you certainly don't go against the principles of the Word of God. So anyway, uh, this is part two, and I'm just finishing off a lot of these thoughts about playing, about being a musician, about my limited talents <laughs> and abilities, and, you know, the relationships we've had over the years. And again, Craig and I are very close to this day. I mean, he's my brother of the Lord, first of all, but really, he understands me. I get him. He gets me. He's got nine kids. I've got four. Uh, so we know about parenting, being having a, a kind of a strange theology. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ of all different, <laughs> of all different stripes. But you know, our theology is a little odd. If you listen to this podcast, 
uh, you'll see, you'll understand, you know, the dispensations and the, the mystery and all those sorts of things that we talk about here. And so we can co-commiserate in that. And you'll get ready to go on a Bible study here, actually out of the Philippines in a couple of minutes. And I love those folks too. I've met some great folks in the world. So anyway, love your friends, love your family, do what you're going to do, do art, play music, sing, write poetry, do it under the sun, but unto the Lord and share it, share it. And then support one another in it. If you know somebody who's doing this kind of thing, let's support one another, All right? Let's listen to the songs. Let's listen to the kids sing. You know, not everybody's the Beatles. Not everybody is going to be Steve Perry singing, but we can support one another. And, you know, just keep our egos in check and just love one another and support each other and just, you know, I'll read your poem if you listen to my song kind of thing. Okay, so we're going to leave it there, and uh, hopefully this has been fun talking about these things, and I want to get back to Scripture, but occasionally I might pick another topic just to talk about, because I like to, you know, just stuff in my life. You get to know me a little better. So, bye-bye, and rock on, and do that thing. <laughs>